I'm speaking to Andy Ferret about the Penny Ghent extensions, uh, in particular the Friday the 13th series. How did you first get involved in caving then? Uh, I started caving back in 1978 with a group called Sunderland Caving Club, who I met through a guy who I started rock climbing with. Uh, his sister uh, was going out with a guy from Sunderland Caving Club and he dragged us off to the hill in one weekend and we really never looked back from there, having had about you know, 12 pints in the uh, hill in on a Friday night. Caving seemed like a pretty good option, really. The uh, year after that, I, I went to university and jo immediately joined uh, Ulsa, uh, very strong caving club at the time with a quite a reputation in the dales in fact because it made lots of discoveries in the 60s and 70s uh, but i joined right at the sort of the tail end of their successful period when they went into quite a sort of a, we're not finding anything anymore phase for a good few years probably about five to six years really before we made any decent discoveries uh, but obviously we spent a lot of time uh, looking for new caves uh, we used to sit in CAF in the University Union and listen to Dave Brook and he'd tell us where to go off and have a look and uh, we'd dutifully go and have a look and think this is horrible, we're not going up here. Uh, but eventually it started to pay off. We, we found little bits and pieces in White Scar Cave uh, and a few other minor bits and bobs around the Dales uh, and we, we, we felt that something was imminent. Uh, and myself and Watty and John Cooper and Malcolm Bass and people like that started to look around at classic old caves like High Hole Pot, uh, Hunt Pot, Little Hole Pot, Pennygent Pot, uh, thinking there's a lot more to be found here behind this Brantskill system somewhere. And uh, it was in 1984, uh, December in fact 1984, that uh, myself and Watty went on a a tour round, uh, I'm trying to think what it's called now, the Blind Pot series in, in Pennygent Pot. We'd been up the Hunt Pot Inlet and noticed that there wasn't any water flowing, so we had a look round the Blind Pot series as well uh, and couldn't really see any notable changes in there. But we sat at Erie Pot and looked across at the, the passage over the other side and thought, hmm, one day we've really got to go back there. Uh, one day turned out to be a couple of years later. Uh, I went down on the same weekend, I went down Hunt Pot with John Cooper and had a good look to see if anything had changed down there at the bottom with water not flowing in the Hunt Pot Inlet anymore, but nothing had changed. Uh, John Watt or Watty and uh, a friend of his called John Belshaw uh, went down Penny Gent and tackled this rather bold step across Erie Pot. Uh, initially, Watty went over using the original rope that Chaz Young had used to go over there, which is some old horsey thing, which I believe is still there if you, if you really want to use it, as is the rope that we used to, to back that up. Uh, but he got across there uh, and then proceeded about 500 feet uh, in a furry suit through a really quite squalid, low, wet crawl that just carried on and on and eventually got bigger and bigger. Uh, and Watty realised that oh, we've actually done it this time, we've actually found something here. Uh, so freezing cold, he decided he'd better turn around and come out and get a bit more moral support because no doubt he would be on a, a carbide light with no backup at this point on his own in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and John Belshaw hadn't come across Erie Pot, he was going to stay where he was to make sure Watty got back alive to the, the other side. Uh, so they came out and uh, when we got back to Leeds that that weekend, there was a, there was a definite sort of powwow going on. Uh, Watty and John came round to to our house and said, "Look, uh, we've actually found a bit of cave here. We're, we're thinking of going back, and we'd like to go back as soon as possible." Uh, so as soon as possible was the following Tuesday. Uh, so we we attempted to get down Pennygen Pot the following Tuesday and failed dismally because it was in flood. <laughs> Uh, so we floated, literally floated to the first pitch, which was completely impassable, and then had a real battle getting back out again. Uh, that would be 10th of June, that Tuesday. Uh, so the following Friday was uh, aptly named, the fr Friday the 13th of June, uh, hence the name of the, the series of passages that we went on to discover there, the Friday the 13th series. 
uh, there were three of uh, four of us in fact went down and it had stopped raining and dried up considerably fortunately uh, there was me Watty, John Belshaw and Ian Brown uh, and what a what a wild exploration trip that was uh, Watty insisted that me and John went through first in the first section of the passage just to experience how hideous what he called psycho crawl was uh, and it really was quite unpleasant it's grovelly low over rocks and cobbles that keep jamming you against the roof and your face is in the water it's it's generally not that nice, but it unfortunately doesn't last too long. Uh, and it got easier as more and more people went through and dredged rocks out of the way, so it became reasonably straightforward after a while. Uh, but that second trip, it was still half full of rocks. Uh, and eventually we got to the nice big bit, we thought, well, we better let Watty go first, because he's found this. So off he went, and of course it was getting bigger and bigger, hands and knees crawling and then stooping. A uh, few passages going off, particularly on the right, one of which later became uh, the highway to hell. Uh, another we named Elm Street. Uh, and then we just sort of it came to like a, a blank wall and the passage really sort of turned a really sharp right. We thought, oh, that's interesting. And looking to the right, we were a bit disconcerted at first. We thought, this might be the end. But, oh no, it just drops down a climb. And I thought, down a climb? This is great. We're coming out of Duke Gill here. Uh, so we dropped down the climb and got to the head of a pitch, even better. Uh, unfortunately we hadn't got any tackle, but we had dragged a whole load of bits of sling and for some reason we'd got bags with, you know, we are still wearing harnesses that we'd used to go across Erie Pot and cow's tails that we'd used to clip on the road. We're still wearing all that, we'd just like ploughed through this thing in our haste to get into the, the new stuff. So we tied all this together and I think I just looped it round a, a lump of rock in the floor and put my foot on it and what he just set off down this pitch and I've never seen anything like it. Uh, hand over hand down a 10 metre vertical pitch uh, into a big chamber which he duly lit up for us which was nice. Uh, all the time we're thinking how the hell is he going to get back up here. Uh, the bad news was just around the corner was a small sump. Uh, so he had to come back up again. Uh, we just didn't watch. You know, he came up pretty powerfully, hand over hand, up all this tap. But uh, it's, it's still one of the craziest things I've ever seen. You know, pure exploration fever, really. Uh, and we, well, that was it for that night. We thought well, this was an overnight trip on a Friday uh, after work. So we piled out. We got out about three or four in the morning, uh, feeling quite pleased with ourselves and. Uh, we probably spent quite a significant amount of Saturday lunchtime in the pub celebrating, <laughs> as you do. Uh, there was a, a small matter of like where on earth were we? Uh, we ploughed through what we thought was maybe a quarter of a mile of cave, four or five hundred metres of passage. Uh, but we had no idea where we'd been, so we needed to survey it at some point. Uh, and again, uh, me and Watty went back down the the next Sunday. Well, we'd been down on the Friday night. We went down again on the Sunday, uh, which would be the twelfth uh, of June in 1986, and piled all the way down to the bottom again and uh, rigged the pitch with a proper ladder so that I could get down there and have a look at it and think, yeah, this is nice. You can actually stand up here, <laughs> look up a pitch. It's quite pleasant. Uh, we pushed a few inlets, including the, the Elm Street inlet. We went up until it forked. Uh, and then we did a bit of surveying on the way out. But uh, it looks really good on the, the drawing in the book, but it was it was surveyed using my backside as a survey station uh, without really stopping very often. Uh, so Watty had to be pretty quick with his uh, sightings and his bearings. But it's, it's proven to be a reasonably accurate survey when further extensions were made uh, and we got a big loop in Pennygent Pot, it proved to be quite accurate so uh, we, we never went back and resurveyed it to grade 5 or anything like that, it was more of a, a rolling survey, more in the NPC style I think than anything else. <laughs> uh, that then led to a, a real flurry of uh, trips then, we, we wanted someone to come and dive the sum, we needed to push all these inlet passages that we'd found. Uh, lots of people got involved, in, including a diver called Julian Griffiths, who many people will have come across and was a regular on Ulster Club nights in the Pack Horse. So we asked him, would you like to come and dive a new something, Penny Gent Pot? And of course he sort of jumped at the chance, really. 
So after a couple of false starts with the uh, the craven detackling the cave for us, very generous of them, uh, we got Julian and a, a load of gear down there. He, he dived through some one and found a nice little bit more walking passage to some two. Uh, but he could hear me whistling uh, the other side of the sump. Uh, it turned out there was a minuscule little airspace all the way through the, the sump, hardly of any use, you couldn't really make use of it. Uh, but the next trip, when he went back to dive in sump two, uh, myself and a number of other people were able to easily free dive through the, for the first sump with crystal clear visibility and we'd all kitted up with hoods and masks and all that sort of stuff so we could actually see where we were going. Uh, and it turned out to be quite an easy dive into the Friday the 13th Part 2, which is a short section of passage to a sump. Um, that was a deeper sump, definitely not a free dive, about 14 metres depth, and Julian dived that for a couple of hundred feet to a boulder blockage, which, that's it, no one's ever been back. Maybe that's something that someone ought to go and do some days, go and revisit that sump. Uh, this coincided, this was like by now, we sort of late June, July and people were starting to go on their summer holidays and I went to the Persia in a place called the, the Gouffre uh, de la Fromagère or something like that in, in France. Uh, so but the pace slowed a bit but people were chipping away at inlets and particularly they were chipping away at something called the Highway to Hell which is off on the, the right. Just crawling up there, getting to a squeeze, smashing it to bits, passing it, coming out, going back down, pushing it a bit further to another squeeze, and so on. And it just went incrementally till the August bank holiday. And we thought, well, this needs finishing off, really. So quite a lot of us went down uh, with a view to push this highway. And I, th I think at that point, uh, Watty and Javed had been stopped by a duck uh, at the farthest point that they'd got to, and they needed... To go in with a hood. Well, I just bought a hood to free dive the the, uh, the first sump. So we took the hood and armed with a, a Petzl zoom and a, a hood, I set off into this duck. Uh, why they let me go, I don't know. They must have had some premonition of what it was like because it just went on and on, you know, four or five hundred feet of low, gloopy passage with uh, pretty much fully submerged with plenty of airspace, you know, six to eight inches of airspace a lot of the time. but. Uh, a long way with your body completely immersed uh, and eventually I got to an Avon in a four mil wetsuit utterly freezing when I stood up in this little Avon, slotty sort of Avon uh, started immediately shivering vigorously and you know, my first thought was mm, I need to get out of here A I'm on my own B I'm caving on a Petzl zoom and with no backup or anything and then they're not renowned for their uh, robustness particularly underwater and uh, no one else around, so I sort of thought, well, that's it for me, I'm off, <laughs> and, uh, and left. And it, it stood there uh, probably a couple of years, I would say. Uh, we tinkered around, we took scaffold poles down through the sump and did some climbing in Friday the 13th, part two. Uh, but that was it, you know, and there was, there was always the nagging doubt that maybe you could climb this haven at the end of the highway. Uh, and ultimately, that's what uh, Malcolm Bass and Adrian Meller promptly did. They, they set off back up there, got to the Avon. I don't think they climbed the Avon, but they just ploughed straight on across the bottom of it and found the Living Dead extensions, uh, which again more or less doubled what we'd found in the Friday the 13th. So absolutely splendid. And uh, I was lucky enough to go back on the, the follow-up trip with Malcolm and Adrian and... Watty and loads of other people, Javed, uh, and got to explore most of the Living Dead extensions as well. So uh, I feel very privileged to have had two trips. Uh, one in Friday the 13th, where we had a sort of massive phase of exploration fever, and then a second one two years later in late 1988, November 1988, uh, where we, we went back and found a whole load more stuff. Uh, probably leaves more questions unsolved. Um, I think the Friday the 13th sump is probably worth another dive. Uh, not by me, I hasten to add. Uh, and somewhere there's probably the same again, if not more, in terms of cave to find. Uh, the end of the Living Dead extensions is well perched above Brant's Gill and carries a screaming draft. Uh, 
so somewhere in there uh, there's a small cave for somebody to find in the future uh, quite where that is uh, don't ask me because we've looked pretty hard and haven't found it so it's going to have to be somebody else turning over the right rock I think uh, another aspect of the living dead uh, is that the, the so called upstream passage comes back very very close to uh, the Huntpot Inlet and I'd already been up the little grovelly crawls off the side at the end of the Hunt Pot Inlet when we'd found that it had stopped flowing. Uh, one trip, particular trip, myself and Paul Monaco were sat at this choke and the others had gone all the way around the highway to hell and into the living dead and we could, we could hear them plain as day on the other side and it was just, oh, we're going to break through here. No problem at all, but it wasn't to be. We, we tried incredibly hard that day and put in a lot of time and effort subsequently to try and make that connection. Um, we even had the uh, what used to be called the Stunt Club, the NCC down there, to blow up some boulders for us. But whether that did any good or did more harm, uh, who knows? Uh, it was a pretty big pop when it went off. Uh, but that remains to be opened. That would make a much, much easier way into the extensions and crawling around the highway. Uh, I can't, those are the sort of probably the main uh, set of trips that we did in there. Um, following that, it sort of got into diving in the downstream sump, really, which was more Dave Brock and Adrian Meller did quite a number of dives in there and made quite good progress, in fact, in there, which has subsequently been followed up by. Uh, Jason Mallinson, who's made even more progress in there. Uh, again, uh, more to do in there as well, and I'm sure that uh, they'll, uh, divers will be returning to that particular sump as well in the future.